I appreciate you joining us for this time of Bible study, and I'm praying that our time together in God's Word will prove to be a real help to you in your spiritual growth. Uh, let me encourage you, if you have your Bible available, to go ahead and get it out and follow along as we look at the Word of God together. And if you don't have your Bible available, maybe you can just get something to write with. Write down the references and go back later when you get a chance and, and check everything we're saying with the Word of God itself. The Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It's not what I say or any other teacher says. Check everything by the Word of God. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, uh, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Well, we prove things with the Scripture. And uh, go to the Scripture for ourselves and look at it for ourselves. That's so very imperative to do. And uh, I aim to teach you the truth on this broadcast, but I recognize that I'm not infallible. Only the Bible is. So check everything with the Word of God. I also want to encourage you to contact me if you ever have any questions or comments about our Bible study time, that you would uh, send me an email or call the church office, and that information will be given at the end of the, uh, of the study time together. And also, I want to encourage you to come out and visit us at Hope Bible Church in Locust Grove. We love to have visitors. We're a friendly church, and we're so thankful for the ministry the Lord's given us, and we emphasize the Word of God. Uh, it, when you come to Hope Bible Church, uh, we believe you're going to learn something. You're going to learn truth from God's Holy Word. We don't emphasize entertainment. Uh, this is not a talent show, but we want to help you to grow spiritually. And uh, we, we put all the emphasis on the Lord and His Word. We sing the hymns of the faith that have right doctrine in them and glorify the Lord and they have substance to them. And then we study God's Word together. And that we have a great church family that's in unity and fellowship. And we'd love to have you come out and visit us anytime. And uh, also, you might want to check out on the website... Uh, HopeBibleChurchGA.com and on that website you can find directions to our church, information about what we believe and our ministries and so forth, but you'll also be able to look at some um, things as far as Bible study is concerned. We have a, a lot of audio studies covering different books of the Bible. We've gone verse by verse through the book of Acts. We've gone verse by verse through the book of Revelation, Ephesians, Romans, and other books, also different topics. We also have written studies, study notes on the book of Revelation, and uh, we have study notes on every book of the Bible, all 66 books, uh, overview notes showing you what the different books are about. And uh, also our, our uh, YouTube channel, which is, there's a link to it on our website. Uh, we have messages from our church services, but also the archives for Bible study time. So this is our, uh, lesson number 11. And uh, we are somewhat going systematically through some things. There is an order to what we're teaching. So if you've missed any of the previous lessons, you might want to go uh, on our website and check those out. That'd be great. And so uh, let's get into the Word of God today. In 2 Timothy 2.15, we are dealing with the major key to Bible study, and that is to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Uh, we started off talking about the, 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 the foundational key, to Bible study and understanding the Word of God is to be saved. You've got to trust Christ as your Savior to have His Spirit in you, and it's only by the Spirit of God that you can understand the Word of God. And then you need to be a Bible believer, and we spent some time on that, showing you we do have a perfect book in the English language. God gave His Word by inspiration. He has preserved His Word. To preserve means to keep the same. He has kept His words pure throughout the generations. He's given us His words in the universal language of the world, the English language, uh, it makes sense in this Gentile age uh, that God would put his word in a Gentile language like English and uh, preserve it for us like he has. And we have uh, the pure word of God in the King James Bible, and that's what we're studying. If you don't really believe the book, you're not going to get very far in understanding the book because without faith it is impossible to please God, the Scripture says. And uh, if, you're, if you're questioning the word of God and you're trying to correct the word of God, and you, you hold yourself up as the authority by looking at all the different versions and picking and choosing what you like. Uh, you've really hindered yourself from coming to see truth. Um, the other versions in English, we've shown you and we've proved to you that they are corrupt, they have errors, they have major problems in them, but the King James, God has used it for 400 years. It has stood the test of time. It's the pure word of God in the English language, and we thank God for it. 
But we've come now to this thing of rightly dividing. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this is our fourth study along these lines, with many more to come. There's a lot to consider here. But we're talking about the fact that all the Bible's for us, it's all the Word of God, and we need all 66 books. Paul made that clear in 2 Timothy 3.16 when he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He said in Romans 15.4, The things written for time written for our learning. He said in 1 Corinthians 10 that some things that happened to Israel in the wilderness were written for our admonition. So it's all for us, but it's not all written to us, and it's not all about us. We're going to have to follow God's rule here and rightly divide the word of truth. In the one verse where he plainly told us to study, he told us how to do it. And he told us our motive ought to be being approved of him. And uh, you see, that's the thing. You, you're going to have to fear the Lord and, and stop fearing man. Proverbs says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. A lot of people, they're not really that interested in the truth if it gets them in trouble. But the truth will get you in trouble with religious people. Paul said, uh, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Uh, he said, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. He said that in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And, uh, you, you know, when you rightly divide the word of truth, it's going to put you at odds with tradition it's going to put you at odds with religion. But you're going to have to fear the Lord, and you're going to have to submit to Him and study to show yourself approved unto God and quit worrying so much about what people think about the thing. Uh, who cares what people think? We want to know what God thinks, all right? Because, you know, people can be wrong, and they usually are. So we want to go by the Word of God because it is the authority. And we want to please the Lord in our Bible study. So he tells us, it's God who tells us through Paul to rightly divide. If we don't rightly divide, then the scripture is going to become unprofitable. We're going to get confused. Uh, we're going to take things out of context, and we're going to wind up believing and, 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 and going by false doctrine. And it's not going to be God's fault, and it's not going to be the Bible's fault. It's going to be our fault for not following clearly the rule God laid out for us in studying his word. We must rightly divide the word of truth. Now... When it comes to rightly dividing the word of truth, it's imperative we, we know what the main division is. We're going to get into some specifics, talking about different baptisms, talking about different um, apostles and churches and different gospels. And there's, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we need to rightly divide. But foundationally, we need to first of all recognize what the main division is. And we began to show you last time, the main division in the Bible is not between Old Testament and New Testament. It's not that. It's not to say that when you come to Matthew, all of a sudden now you're dealing with the church in this age. And No, that's not so. And we began to show you that last time. But we want to show you very clearly in the Word of God what the main division is. Look in two passages. If you'd get both of these and look at them together, get Acts chapter 3. In Romans 16, all you've got to do is compare these passages and you'll know what the main division is. And it won't be because th this is my teaching and I I've got some newfangled idea. It's not about what I'm saying at all. It's about what God has said and what I'm about to show you is right here in the book. And it's been here the whole time. It's just unfortunate that so many people either are ignorant of it or they reject it because it goes against their beloved religious tradition. In Acts chapter 3... The Word of God says in verse number 19, Peter is preaching to Israel. No doubt about it. And, um, I mean, he says very plainly in verse 12, he said, Ye men of Israel. So that's who he's talking to. Verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So Israel as a nation uh, gets put under a new covenant. They get their sins blotted out as a nation at the second coming of Christ. Paul said to us in this age that we have now received the atonement. Uh, the moment we trust Christ, we are justified. We are saved instantly, permanently. But Israel's got to go through a trial of their faith. They're going to have to go through a tribulation, enduring that faithfully. And at the second coming, their sins will be blotted out, he said. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, 
whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken, listen to this, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now that's crystal clear. What Peter's talking about to Israel concerns the things God spoke through the prophets since the world began. If you skip down to verse 24, he said, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. The days they were living in in this context. It was according to prophecy. Spoken through the prophets concerning Israel and their kingdom. Now look in Romans 16, and Paul writes Romans. If you know anything about Romans, you know that's not Israel. You know Romans are Gentiles. And he's writing to some believers at Rome, and he's, he's, uh, he says here at the end of, of the epistle in chapter 16, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now he says my gospel because there is a gospel that Christ revealed to him that was not preached before him. How do I know that? Because in Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12, it says that. It says Paul received his gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. See, a mystery in the scripture is not something you can't know. Rather, it was something you could not know until God revealed it because it was a secret. But once it's revealed, God wants you to know it. So there's a revelation here, the mystery, and it was kept secret since the world began. Now, Peter said, I'm talking to you about things that were spoken since the world began. Paul said, I'm talking to you about things that were secret since the world began. Now, I'm not the... I'm not the most brilliant man, that's for sure. But I'm smart enough to know that's something different. And I think you are too. I think everybody is. It's very simple, folks, if you just let it say what it does. If you've got information being spoken by the prophet since the world began, and then you have information that was secret since the world began, it can't be the same information. There must be a division there. And it is the main division in the Word of God is between the prophesied kingdom program of Israel and the mystery program of the body of Christ. And God hinted at it in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, what a distinction between heaven and earth. The, the, his purpose for the heaven, uh, that concerns the body of Christ. But see, he planned it before the world began, but he kept it secret since the world began until he revealed it to Paul. And he revealed it to Paul according to Ephesians 3 and Colossians 1, for an example, very clear. And so you have his program for the heaven, that was a secret. His program for the earth, that was spoken from the beginning. All the prophets spoke of it since the world began. God's purpose to set up a kingdom on the earth, and Israel is going to be his nation to do that. Uh, Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied of the second coming of Christ, according to Jude, verse 14 and 15. Okay, so we have this main division. Now let's look at it in some detail. Let's, let's consider some things. Um, points of contrast. Number one, the prophetic program of Israel concerns a kingdom, a political organization. But the mystery program of the body of Christ concerns a body, a spiritual organism. So kingdom, political organization, body, spiritual organism. Those things are very different. Okay, We're not a nation, the body of Christ. When you trust Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God puts you in Christ. You're bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, spiritually joined to the Lord. You're a member of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not a nation. Okay, that, Israel's a nation. And, and Daniel 2.44 it talks about the God of heaven setting up a kingdom on the earth that shall never be destroyed. And that's the kingdom of heaven you read about in the book of Matthew. 
Jesus taught his apostles to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is not dying and going to heaven. No, the kingdom of heaven is the God of heaven setting his kingdom up on the earth. And that's got to do with Israel. Okay, But we are a spiritual organism. And 1 Corinthians 12, uh, it's so clear what Paul says here about the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, he says this, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized in one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and we've been all made to drink in one Spirit. Now, <clears throat> that's obviously spiritual. If, it, if it's not Jew or Gentile, it's a spiritual thing because in our flesh there is distinctions. There's racial distinctions. But in the body of Christ, it's a spiritual body. In Galatians 3, he said that um, there's neither... He said, you've been baptized into Christ in verse 27. And then he says in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Well... That's not talking about water baptism. That's, that's, it's ludicrous to read verses like that and think that's talking about water. Because you can baptize somebody with water, and if they're a female, they're still a female. If they're a male, they're still a male. Okay, Nothing changes physically. But the Spirit identifying you, and that's what baptism basically is. It's an identification. The Spirit of God identifying you with Christ. He's the head. We're the members. We're one body. It's a spiritual body. We all have the same position. And uh, there's those distinctions, those earthly distinctions are gone. It's a spiritual body. Okay, so the Spirit of God baptizes us into the body of Christ. And that happens the moment of salvation. Number two, the kingdom is going to be established on the earth. Jeremiah 23, 5 talks about the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, reigning on the earth, that on the earth that He will execute judgment. Uh, Jeremiah 23, I'll flip over there and read it real quick. Jeremiah chapter, and follow along if you have your Bible. Let's search the scriptures together. Jeremiah 23 verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. The kingdom is to be established on earth. But the body of Christ is given a position in heavenly places. All right? Ephesians 2 said that uh, in verse 5 and 6 that he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. See, being baptized into the body of Christ, we're crucified with him, buried with him, risen with him. We're even ascended up and seated with him in heavenly places. It says in Ephesians 2, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the kingdom is to be established on the earth, but the body of Christ is given a position in heavenly places. Number three, the kingdom was prophesied since the world began, but the body of Christ, though we were chosen in Christ before the world began, we were kept secret since the world began. Now we already showed you that by comparing Acts 3 and Romans 16, but look at Ephesians 3. This is very clear. By the way, in Ephesians 1, it says that we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. That simply means that God, according to His foreknowledge, knew that there would be those who would trust Christ as Savior. And so He had this plan before the world began. But nobody got in Christ until they trusted Christ as their Savior. But it was still God's eternal purpose, something He planned before the world began, but He kept it a secret till He revealed it to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1, for this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now listen, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now Christ directly revealed it to Paul. He wrote it down, he preached it, and then the Spirit helped uh, others to see it through Paul. 
but Paul's the one who got it first. He said that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And he goes on to talk about the eternal purpose and so on. It was hid in God until he revealed it to Paul. All right, number four, Israel is to be given supremacy over the nations. But Jew and Gentile are placed on the same level before God, and when they believe the gospel, they're baptized in the one body. That's very different. Uh, Israel is to be the head of the nations. They're to rise above the nations. The Gentiles are to come to their light. And on and on it goes in prophecy about God's purpose for Israel. But in the mystery, uh, Paul said there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no advantage anymore in this age to being a Jew. Now, being a Jew in the past, under the law, you weren't saved automatically just because you were a Jew. You still had to believe God, but it gave you an advantage. And there's no advantage now. Uh, it's all the same. And when you believe the gospel, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're baptized into one body. It's not about Israel having supremacy over Gentiles. We're one in Christ. Number five, the Gentiles are to be blessed through Israel's rise in instrumentality according to the prophetic program of Israel. You can read about that in like Zechariah chapter 8. It talks about how uh, there's going to be ten men who take hold of a Jew out of ten men from different nations saying, we'll go with you, God is with you. Talking about in the kingdom, how the Gentiles are going to worship the Messiah through Israel being a kingdom of priests. So through their rise, through their instrumentality, and yet according to the mystery program, the Gentiles are blessed through Israel's fall and diminishing. That's very different. So in, in the prophetic program is uh, gentiles are blessed through israel's rise and in instrumentality the gentiles could be blessed but they had to be blessed through israel but today in the age of grace and in the, in the mystery program uh, we're blessed without israel we're blessed through their fall and diminishing in romans 11 it talked about uh through the fall of israel that uh salvation was sent to the gentiles and and so on. You can read there in Romans 11. In fact, I'll go ahead and take the time to do that. We've got a few more minutes. In Romans 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And uh, he said, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness Verse 15 says, If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Now Paul's point in Romans 11 is that he's not finished with Israel. Israel fell. Israel's been diminished. Israel's been cast away. God's not blessing us through Israel today. But when he's done building the body of Christ, he will resume where he left off with Israel, and he will yet save that nation. But they fell in Acts 7 when they stoned Stephen. They were diminished through the transition period recorded in the book of Acts. They've been cast away. We're blessed without Israel in this age. Number six, prophecy mainly concerns nations. And there's many verses to bear that out. But God's focus in prophecy is on his chosen nation, Israel, ruling over the nations. But the mystery concerns primarily individuals. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. If any man be in Christ, doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, any individual that believes the gospel is a new creature in Christ. Number seven, prophecy concerns blessings, both material and spiritual on earth. You can read Isaiah 11 to get a glimpse of that. They're going to be blessed materially and they're going to be blessed on earth, but the mystery concerns all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 3, that he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We have all of that the moment of salvation. We're complete in him. Our blessings are not on the earth. We're not promised earthly prosperity. 
uh, we have spiritual blessings that are far better. But there's a distinction between the blessings. Our blessings are in heavenly places. Number eight, in the prophetic program of Israel, Christ comes again to save his people Israel and to establish his kingdom on the earth. He's coming back to the earth. In Revelation 1, 7, every eye shall see him. And he's coming very publicly in all of his glory. And he's coming back to the earth. But in the mystery program, Christ comes for his body, the church, to take us up to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, we which are alive to remain, uh, it says, shall be caught up together to meet them in, uh, in the air, and so shall we ever be. Uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, Paul talks about our rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. He said, I show you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, this I say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul doesn't quote Old Testament prophecy about the rapture because it's not there. It was revealed to him. We're looking for Christ to catch us up to heaven. He's not coming all the way back to the earth in the rapture. That's a different event. Uh, the rapture could happen today. Second coming can't happen until certain signs take place and are fulfilled, according to Matthew 24. But these are different things. We're going to be raptured out, then the tribulation, then the second coming. Number nine, justification is by a man's faith and it must be proven by works. James, who wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, he didn't write to the body of Christ, he wrote to the 12 tribes. There's no 12 tribes in the body of Christ. He said, a man is not justified by faith only, but by a faith that works. His faith must be proven by his works. He must endure the time of tribulation. But Paul said, we're justified by faith alone. It's faith without works. We're justified by the faith of Christ. Not our faith that must be proven, but his faith, the faith of Christ that was already proven and that's why we're justified instantly the moment we believe on Christ. Romans and James are very different. James 2 and Romans 3 and 4, very distinct. Rightly divide the word of truth and it'll make perfect sense. And lastly, the proclamation of the prophetic program was committed particularly to the 12 apostles. Jesus told the 12, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in Matthew 19, 28. But the proclamation of the mystery was committed particularly to Paul and in Colossians 1, at the end of the chapter, Paul talked about his distinct ministry that God revealed the mystery to him to make it known. He had a lot of help, a lot of workers working with him like Timothy and uh, Silas and so on. But it was Paul representing the one body versus the 12 apostles representing the 12 tribes of Israel. I just gave you 10 points of distinction that prove the vast difference between the prophetic kingdom program of Israel and the mystery program of the body of Christ. That's the main division. I have this study in outline form. I'd love to send it to you. Just give me uh, your address. You can email me or call the church office. Let us have your address, and we'll, free of charge, drop one of these studies in the mail, and you can look at all these references we talked about and others that are included in the study that I didn't mention, and you can search for yourself and see whether these things are so. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll join us again next time.